This is the GPL Podcast, sponsored by Vintage Minnesota Hockey, your exclusive source for throwback Minnesota jerseys. Visit VintageMNHockey.com. Now, here's Hammy, Vigo, and your host, Jupiter. Good evening and welcome to another GPL podcast, episode number 119. Um, we're back here, missing Hammy again this week. Looks like Hammy's in Florida on business. Uh, according to his Facebook, it looks like he's not doing much business. He's just hanging out at the beach, but that's probably really not true. But back as always is Viggs. You're always with me. It's Hammy that just can never find it, find a way to show up apparently. Big business, get it done. Yeah, he's got to get that business done. Hopefully, we'll have to see. Um, you know, I'm I'm wa- kind of watching the wild game here, uh, Viggs. And uh, what's what, what's with that team? I know we like to talk the Gophers here, but uh, if the Wild don't start get it going here, um, we're going to need all these people to jump on the Gopher bandwagon. Well, there's certainly a lot of them on the Wild bandwagon, and quite the following, obviously. Uh, I can't diagnose it other than they are not playing up to their capability. I don't know what it is, but they uh, they are not playing very well right now, and they have the talent to do it. Uh, it's just such a fine line in the NHL. If, boy, it is, and you know, and, and it is with the college hockey as well. Obviously, so you've talked a lot in the past. Well, you know, we tend to enjoy college hockey because the mistakes in college hockey is what makes it so fun. You don't see that as much in the NHL, but. Uh, uh, last weekend, Minnesota didn't make too many mistakes. Gave up one goal on the weekend. You know, their penalty kill was uh, 100% on the weekend, so that's positive. Power play, you know, one goal, not too bad. But uh, overall, a good weekend with a 3-1 and a 4 nothing victories. Yeah, I thought it was one of those weekends where Minnesota managed the puck really, really well. <clears throat> it was pretty obvious that they didn't have their A game. They weren't really un- completely as far as, you know, first pass, first touch, clean breakout, but they they played smart enough to win both games. And I think sometimes when you you don't have your, your best game, you need to rely on puck management and goal to, to get you through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you do. I mean, uh, I, I would say one of the big positives on the weekends, you know, was that we finally did get Sheehy on the goal scoring board here. It, it, it had been a struggle yeah, for think, him. I think he's definitely been playing through something. You know, he sat out a week of practice and a weekend of games uh, to, to rest something to get back. Uh, been pretty good with not disclosing what the injury is, but it was obvious that he was nursing through something. And then also, I don't think they were using him in a spot where he was comfortable on the power play. You know, he they had him on the flank, you know, outside the dots near the circles, and that's really not a spot where he's going to one-time the puck, you know, catch and shoot kind of guy. And so I think moving closer to the net is, is probably where he feels more comfortable and actually has more success. So I think making that personnel adjustment is something that, that helps him. He mentioned it that they made some, you know, some personnel changes on the power play, and I think that's really going to help him going forward and maybe spark his game a little bit. Nate Wells apparently thinks your your audio mix is the equivalent of a of the picture on an old Wild Forty Five game. <laughs> wow, Nate! Thanks. <laughs> well, that's just... you looked great at practice day too in your fighting pants jersey or hoodie. <laughs> he wasn't in a suit. No suit. No time. suit for oh availability God. on Wednesday. Want to I... go fighting Saints hoodie? I have never seen Nate without like a tie and and a shirt or something nice. But since he's not on he, the podcast, he gets dressed, dressed up. But I want to see. I want to see him with a tie a scarf at the game, like uh, like Burke does. <laughs> oh boy! Well, we've, we're going to have more from Nate later because he wants to know what our favorite Michigan Minnesota memories are, and I think I've got quite a few, and I bet you you have quite a few as well. Um. Boy, specialty teams this year has been a struggle. Uh, they've done a little better lately. You know, the penalty kill has been, you know, I don't think they've given up penalty, a power play goal in 
four, four games, five games now, and I think in the four games, I think they've got a fourteen kill streak going right now. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, the only way you're going to fix that is just keep killing penalties. I know they are taking less penalties, which is also advantageous. I mean, I saw this weekend, you know, well, they took seven penalties on the weekend. Um, not the greatest, but they were doing much worse earlier in the year. Sometimes they were taking three three penalties a period. Yeah, four and three is something you can work with, especially it seems like Dallin she has figured a few things out with his penalty kill units where he's, you know, got Novak and, and Sheehy taking some draws and they've been good, you know, if they can get on their strong side. And they've been getting clears. Eric Shearhorn mentioned that today, that that's really the biggest difference in their penalty kill is that they're killing for a less, you know, less time because they're able to win draws and clear the zone right away. And then deny, you know, any kind of rush through the neutral zone. I think that's so key for a power play to get through the neutral zone clean and get set up. And the Gophers have been pretty good at denying that. You know, we had heard that Michigan State was a, a little different team this year, a little more offensive, but uh, that really didn't come to fruition this past weekend. Only one goal on the weekend. Uh, not a good not a good weekend for Michigan State at all. I thought they looked a little bit better than they've looked in the past in terms of their skating ability. Uh, Minnesota just did a pretty good job of not giving any kind of rush to Michigan State. Anytime Minnesota had a turnover, there's a lot of back pressure by the forwards. Uh, you know, it's really hard for Michigan State to get anything going. I think they're a little limited in the fact that they don't have a lot of depth. And in their top forward group uh, with Kordodenko was going out against Lindgren. They just had a hard time getting anything going. Well, hopefully we see an improved Michigan State team, you know, in the coming years because, you know, we've seen Michigan State, you know, when they were in the CCHA, they had a lot of good teams. I mean, a national championship team not too long ago, so – you know, for for the the Big Ten to build to where we want it to be, um, Michigan State's one of those teams we can't have at the bottom every year. And I don't think they will be. I think they've shown that they've got a little bit more offense this year. Uh, the Big Ten is going to be a tough league for them to play in this season. There's a lot of talent in the league. They're probably at the bottom, but they look better than they've been in the past. Well, let me look here. I know we had quite a few questions that uh, you and I are going to look at this week. Um, oh, oh, here we go. I know Mark Erickson. We're talking about the Big Ten this year and the strength. Mark Erickson wants to know, is Notre Dame now the biggest thing standing between Minnesota and a fifth straight Big Ten regular season title? I'm thinking it's, it's you know Notre Dame Certainly and Wisconsin. feels like it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Notre Dame's definitely a tough test for Minnesota. I'm a little surprised that they're hanging in there despite all their losses last year. They lost their goalie, uh, lost for their top forwards. You know, they returned Jordan Gross, great defenseman. I think they're getting a little more offense from their blue line than the Gophers are right now. Uh, but then Wisconsin, you know, they've got Frederick up front and then Hayden in that. Uh, that's going to be a tough out for anyone. Definitely going to be a tough out. Um, boy, we've got quite a couple more questions here. Um, oh, I asked, let's keep with Mark Erickson since he uh, asked her quite a few hours ago. Ryan Lindgren seemed more aggressive on offense last weekend. Is that a change driven by the coaching staff? And what can we expect from him in the future? You know, we, we were at both. Well, I was at both games. Uh, you were at the Saturday game. It did seem like he wanted to step up and 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 participate. I, I saw the same move two nights in a row for him. One night he scored, the second night he didn't. But uh, you know, the first goal on Friday night, you know, it was it was Sadek and Lindren going in, making a play. The two defensemen and I, I believe the forwards might have been changing at the time. So uh, that's definitely one thing that the coaching staff has been talking about is stepping up when you have the chance. And it looks like Lindgren is starting to do that kind of thing. Well, I think the key for guys up is seeing that they've got support behind them and obviously when there's a line, a line change happening behind you know there's going to be three guys back there uh, so I don't think we'll see that all the time with the defenseman joining the rush but when they do have opportunity I know that the green light that's something that you know Don Leo wants out of his team is he wants defensemen who can skate and join the rush and so as long as they have you know cover back there got the green light to do that now if you last man back and you're trying to make a move by a guy in the forecheck that's probably a yellow light, red light situation for a D. So you don't want to see them doing that. 
Then on the other side, in the offensive zone, Don Shear really wants his defenseman involved in the offense. He doesn't want to play three on five in that zone. He wants them to play five on five. So that means forwards getting the puck up to the point like Gates did with Danny on Saturday. And, you know, they got a lot of shots from the blue line. I think it was close to double digits both nights from the defense putting shots on that. You know, that offense, you know, gets chaos in that zone and makes the other teams skate and get out of position a little bit more stress on the goalie and um, gives you all those rebound opportunities that you need when you're playing against a hot goalie. <laughs> and we always seem to run into hot goalies come NCAA time. So <laughs> it's a good thing to figure it out now. I'll tell you that. Okay. Well, I mean, you got to be able to score in different ways. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. can score off the rush, you can score off your special teams and you can score with traffic and greasy goals. You know, those are three different ways to score and, Minnesota sometimes is a little too reliant on rush and power play scoring. They need to find other ways to score. And getting your blue line involved is a good way to do that. Hey, curious. You know, I had heard the scan tickets Friday night was, you know, about 5,058. Um, now it was a little more than that. Did you hear anything for Saturday night? Because it did look like Saturday night's crowd was better. In, it had probably in the 6,000 range at least. Did you hear anything? I didn't hear anything. With the early start time, People uh, filtered out pretty quick to uh, to get to their dates with their their wives and significant others and things like that. So there wasn't a lot of mulling around at seven o'clock around Mariucci. Uh, so I didn't hear. It definitely looked like there were more fans. I saw somebody on Twitter say that it looked worse on Saturday, and I don't think that was the case at all. I no, think there were wasn't. probably at least six. 6,500 there yeah, watching. I, I'm thinking you're right because the crowd did look much better on uh, on Saturday afternoon than it did Friday. But uh, still, you know, the topic we talked about last week and and as we learned kind of even this week, uh, uh, I saw a retweet from Jess Myers yesterday talking. Well, it was either, I believe, a BC game last night, Tuesday night. I'm not sure, but – Middle of the game, there was a lot of empty seats. And uh, Jess is, you know, in joking, says, you know, it must be the Big Ten's fault that no one's showing up at Boston College games. But uh, it's not just here where, you know, some other big programs are having problems as well. Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, attention for, for your dollar these days, especially in a place like Boston. You know, there's other things to do <laughs> than watch hockey. Just like in Minneapolis, there's other things to do. I know... You know, people were talking about the deer opener and um, section finals for high school football. You know, those are things that impact attendance. And uh, you can't get around that stuff. People apparently like venison. <laughs> well, there are actually many times when we had uh, – we were heading to Duluth for deer opener. It seems like a couple of years in a row we were in Duluth for the deer opener and some people just refused to go because of that. I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? But what can you do? What can you do? Oh, I see the wild lost again. Isn't that sweet? Yep. Come jump How on unusual. The, yeah, come jump on the Gopher bandwagon, folks. Much better team. Um, getting better as it goes and not getting worse like it seems like the wild are. So jump on the Gopher bandwagon. We'll take you because we need more people in the stadium. <laughs> and it's a team that will be playing competitive games that excel in April. And yeah, yeah, yeah it could be. I'm not sure that the, the the wild will be. I mean, if they don't get their act together. Um, all right, let me see if we can get more questions before we head to the break real quick. Ooh, Eric Raymond was wondering. He was thinking of going to uh, the game, you know, for you know against St. Cloud in, in was it January sixth and eighth, I believe. I mean, you realize it's a Saturday right? Sunday because they they plan to do it after the World Juniors. The final should be on that Friday night. Okay. And okay. so they're playing St. Cloud Saturday, Sunday. So Moscow oh, okay. can be back. And Lucia said today, you know, it's pretty obvious that players from St. Cloud and Minnesota will be playing that week. And that's what his question is. He's kind of wondering how the, the World Juniors is going to affect it. And uh, I'm glad that they uh, move some things around, though. You might have some tired players because um, if they do play up to the gold medal game, um, uh, where is the juniors this year? It's in Buffalo, I believe. Oh, yeah, so they love to keep it close to the border yeah, so they, all the Canadians come across. Yep, yeah, and there's a USA-Canada outdoor game this year as well. Yeah, but that is a pre-tournament game. Just so people yeah, know. Yeah, it's, it's not okay. a tournament game. It's kind of one of those pre-tournament games that don't count in the standings, but uh, 
which I'm glad because I don't think a game like that should be played outdoors. So luckily, it's just a, a warm up game to uh, to the to the World Juniors. But boy, yeah, that is always my favorite. T- one of my favorite times of the year is you know I can I can tune in to you can tune in. Well, I tune in through my through a couple apps on my phone and watch the games while at work. Nobody heard that at work, by the way. And uh, oh boy, the hockey is just—it's some of the best hockey in the world, leagues. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's definitely one of those games where both teams are going to make mistakes because guys are taking risks that they usually take. Except in this game, that you know they're really talented on the other side. It's kind of like watching Michigan, Minnesota. You know, when there's <laughs> mistakes, the other team has the skill to take advantage of it. And and maybe that's why it is so good because you know you you got a lot of young kids that are going to be superstars one day and they do it is a similar game to college in that like you said there's there's mistakes that happen uh, I mean all the time and 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 it, but the skill level is much higher but these these kids are still learning and uh, and uh, it, it, it it just seems to get better and better each year and it always seems to come down between you know U.S. and Canada at least it seems to do it a lot. Um, We'll see if it's that's the case this year because you know you never know. Every once in a while, you've got the Russians sneaking in there, but uh, uh, it's something. And to uh, get there, Raymond, the the Gophers are probably going to be missing middle stat Lindgren for mm-hmm. that week, mm-hmm. those two weeks. Um, whether Which or not is, they miss yeah. the entire St. Cloud series, we'll see. But they'll they'll probably miss that first game. Yeah, I'm guessing that uh, you know it, it's a game on the road uh, in St. Cloud that first game, and I, I'm thinking that uh, the Don will give those guys the night off um, just for that reason. They'll be coming right back, and I'm guessing you know St. Cloud being a home game, they might try to play those. Moscow's might might try to play those guys. Um, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Because you know? um, boy, St. Cloud, what a good team so far this year. Well, I, we'll see if they can keep it going all the way through. Uh, through December because uh, right now they are on fire seven and all I believe aren't they? Yeah, they have got a great offense this year, great line, and their goaltending's been better. And when they're having an off night, they can outscore their trouble. Well, now Nate Wells is saying the outdoor game will count for group round. I was told last year that that was not the case, but if it is, that's a joke. They should not be playing a game that counts on out on the outdoor ice. It's just they shouldn't do it. That's like playing a Stanley Cup game on an outdoor ice. It's a gimmick. Don't do it. I don't know. Well, it's not quite like a Stanley Cup game, and especially in the World Juniors, those round-robin games before have, have meant less and less each year because I don't think there's a buy anymore that you can win out of it. So Yeah, but they – they It's a, it's a moneymaker chance you know, to USA I, hockey. I don't think it is part of the group. development program. I, I don't think it's part of group play, though, because should they even be in the same group since they finished 1-2 last year? They should be in separate groups. It, I'm pretty sure they're in the same group. They, they, How, uh, they, they fix it so they get that game. That, well, I thought it, I always thought it was a preseason game. Nate, keep looking because I, I thought, you know, if they finished 1-2 last year, they should not be in the same group the following year. They should be in different groups because, you know, you take number one, number two, and it goes back and forth, doesn't it? Isn't that how they used to seed these things? So look into it more. I don't think they do it that way anymore. Oh, well, that's stupid. I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe Nate will find it out because I don't have time to look it up right now. Um, any other thoughts on this past weekend? I mean, obviously they, they get uh, six points, which is the most important thing. Uh you know, one thing that's going to be goofy about the Big Ten this year is there's always going to be, a, you know, once we get more into the heart of the schedule, there's always going to be someone not playing that weekend, which is going to be kind of goofy. Um, eventually it all evens out, but it's it's going to be kind of goofy having odd number of teams this year. Yeah, I think it's, you know, one reason you're going to see it is you're going to see some non-conference games sprinkled in, which I think is good for teams in the long run. You know, if you have a young team and you play all of your out of conference games early, it really impacts your pair wise quite a bit. Um, Big Ten, luckily this year, has done exceptionally well non conference. Uh, they could be the top conference in that stat, so that's going to help in the pair wise down the stretch. And you know, it's just something you get used to. It'll be nice to to sprinkle in conference games throughout. It will be because you know, you know, we have obviously we have Harvard coming in next weekend, which is a Definitely a top team, even though they haven't played much yet. Um, Army, not much of a, an opponent in December. But then you do look forward, you know, the second half of the year, 
you've got St. Cloud State, and we, obviously we don't have the the North Star Cup anymore. And after that, it is pretty much it's all solid, you know, games through all the way through the end of the Big Ten season. So it's not it's quite the same as it used to be. I'm guessing one of those other teams will have to sneak in a couple of non-conference games. But uh, looking at the schedule here, it's not much of the case for Minnesota. Yeah. I'm not seeing that, but. Uh, we but I thought it was a good start to the Big Ten for the Gophers. I think their power play is, is making progress. They're finding out some things that they need to know uh, in terms of personnel. I think you're going to see a little bit more of that overload look from them where they've got Pitlick and Middlestat working out of the their off wings with Sheehy on the on his off wing closer to the net. Um, you're going to see more of that in-zone offense using the defenseman for point shots. And I think you're just going to see the Gophers start shooting the puck more. It's such an emphasis right now with the coaching staff on the players. Okay, well, before we get into Michigan and a couple more of your questions, we need to hear from our sponsor. VintageMNHockey.com is a proud sponsor of the GPL podcast. Well, what is Vintage MN Hockey? Well, it's kind of the place to get all of your history of Minnesota hockey, from the pros to the minors, the collegiate teams, to even the high school teams. All information about any of those teams can be found on VintageMNHockey.com. They also have great interviews with some historical Minnesota hockey figures like John Mayasic and Lou Nanny, Glenn Sonmore, some of the greats of Minnesota hockey. So make sure you check out those interviews. It's a really great thing. But as like I always say, I think my favorite part is the store. The store, you can buy a custom historical jersey from the Gophers or the Bulldogs or some of your favorite high school teams. And if you do make a purchase, just use the code GPL podcast, all one word, and you'll get 10% off your order. So make sure you visit vintagemnhockey.com and follow them on Twitter at vintage MN hockey. Well, you both confirmed it Vegas. It is, it is a, it is a it is round Robin game, which I think is bogus, but, uh, We'll have to see if at the, with the World Juniors. I just I don't like U.S. playing Canada outside on on who knows how what the ice is going to be like. But uh, yeah. obviously, it's a round robin game, not as big a deal. But it could it could you know we'll see what happens later on. But uh, yeah, what was they say they placed together for the benefit of the outdoor game? First time in a few years, it didn't work out naturally. Is what Nate says. So they so, cooked the books to get they, that big they, money they, game. You know I. I maybe it was just a year ago when I, I was kind of questioning. Is I think originally it may have been it was going to be a pre-tournament game. I know I saw that somewhere, but uh, maybe I'm just losing it because I'm getting old. Who knows? Well, let's so speaking Could of be Nate, a combination. Oh boy, you have no idea. Um, Nate had uh, he he would like to know what are our favorite Michigan Minnesota memories, and uh, uh, my my initial memories go back to some of uh, you know some of those. Uh, the, the, the Thanksgiving tournament, the college hockey showcase, when both Michigan and Michigan State would come here or we would go there. And, you know, that tournament first started at, at the large arenas. You know, we'd have uh, you know, Michigan come in to, uh, you know, the Civic Center or, or we'd go, we'd play them at Bradley Center or in Detroit. Um, uh, I distinctly remember a game where Minnesota, you know, played Michigan in front of a full crowd at the Civic Center for the College Hockey Showcase. And it was, you know, I think Brian Bonin got a late goal to give him the victory. And that's one of my kind of early memories of, of this of this series because, you know, in the late 80s, they weren't playing Michigan hardly at all because they weren't in the conference. They didn't have this College Hockey Showcase. I really think most people started seeing Michigan when they started playing them in the College Hockey Showcase. Don't forget that mute button, Vix. <laughs> I, I I was wondering what was coming up next there. I mean, my favorite <laughs> memory of Michigan is obviously the Frozen Four game. Yeah, uh, I think that was two thousand three. You know, that was a pretty fun one to watch. It, it's always <laughs> great to see them play each other though, because they play such similar styles. You know, when you play a team that's that's going to play defensive, like that Michigan State team used to do. You know, they'd be in that trap and they'd sit back and they'd only wait for you to make mistakes. When they're playing Michigan under a Red Berenson or a Mel Pearson coach team, you know, they're looking to create offense too. They're looking to jump in the rush. And you can see that back and forth hockey. I think, you know, you put those two schools with, you know, Boston College, and that's kind of the elite of college hockey that play that style. And it's a lot of fun to watch. 
Yeah, obviously you cannot forget that 2003 game with the Vanek with the overtime winner. Obviously, was was a pretty big deal. I bet you Michigan was not. Wolf. <laughs> and I bet you Michigan definitely wasn't happy because that was two years in a row that Michigan was taken out by the Gophers in the Frozen Four. So they were a little bit bitter. But you know, I remember quite a few games in the '90s where they took us out and. Uh, I was not happy, and all you have to do is say Mike Leg, and that brings back a lot of memories for people, and it's it's a bad memory. It was a great goal, but uh, I, I can still see that in the, in my mind going, what the heck just happened? So and you're talking memories, Nate. That's a bad memory, I think, for us all. It felt like during the Woog era, Mission was always a team that just broke – go for hearts in the playoffs it just they'd always run into each other and for whatever reason minnesota make that one more mistake or that one crazy play would happen and growing <laughs> up you know the, the, those are a lot of games i watched on tv and in, in fuzzy standard definition <laughs> yeah and you know, one thing that was always frustrating though is that you know michigan had some obviously some great teams in the 90s um it seems like minnesota would play them very well and beat them you know, by a goal or two in the college hockey showcase. But then when it came playoff time, they would lose to Michigan by a goal. And it was just heartbreaking. Um, we've got, uh, well, we've got Hammy. I don't know if Hammy's actually listening. He could be, but uh, and he, he wants to know <laughs> anonymously, can we send Hammy on the road every week to tropical locales that have attractive ladies so he's not boring us on the podcast? <laughs> He's in Tampa or something like that right now, just uh, soaking up the rays while we're here in cold Minnesota. That son of a bitch. Well, it is recruiting week where players are signing their NLIs. <laughs> Maybe so, Hammy's making some deals. <laughs> Hammy's wheeling and dealing in, in Tampa, St. Petersburg, just having a good time. Uh, who needs you, Hammy? Maybe we'll just kick you off the podcast. Who needs you? I guess we don't. Kidding, Hammy. We definitely need you. Um, let's get some, get to some other questions here. Um, uh, I know there was a couple more. I just got to scroll up a little bit. Oh boy. Where did some of these go? Oh, well, some people complaining about TV again, um, with no TV Friday night. Again, this is one of the many reasons why college hockey is down in this market. Hard to follow a team. We love when games aren't on TV. That's a, Scott Herrick from earlier today. Um, boy, I, I, I'm just having a, having a hard time complaining about an occasional game that's not on TV, Viggs. Yeah, I mean, they have the best TV deal of any school in college hockey. You know, I think it's 31 games you'll be able to get on TV and a couple you'll get streaming. You know, this weekend, if you know, you're a U of M person, you can get that BTN stream of the game that's the in-arena feed. Um, there's lots of options to do it. So it's, it's not that big of a deal in my mind. In the old WCHA, they'd have games down on TV either. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, people tend to forget, you know, there's many times where the games weren't on TV and we were listening to the old radio. So um, I, think I love people, those games that were on TV, but they didn't send out the announcers. And so they'd have Woog and Mazako okay. in St. Paul or something calling the game okay, that was on the screen. That was one weekend. <laughs> um, it seems like it was more than yeah, once, but it was, it was such a great experiment. It was, and it was really bad. And it was, I remember it was Colorado College, and they sent Marnie out there, and that was it. Everything else was green screen, and it was, well, to a few of us, obvious. I, I think they pulled it off pretty well for the most of the people. Um, that one just didn't quite turn out so well. Um, we have a, a message here from Jess on the, the Mixler chat, and he wants to know, Viggs, when you're going to have another article in The Athletic? What are you working on right now? I'm working on a feature on Eric Shearhorn right now. It should be in uh, this week, probably Friday. And uh, lots of insights into his offseason about how he stepped it up to another level and you know, everyone noticed he's been by far the most consistent player for the Gophers so far this season. Um, his goals against save percentage, probably the best it's ever been uh, in his Gopher career. You know, he's climbing up the shutout um, chart for most career shutouts by a Gopher. Uh, really cementing himself as one of the premier goalies wearing the maroon and gold. I can't disagree with that. I think uh, 
And one thing I have noticed is that the defense in front of him is playing a bit better than it used to. Um, I want to say his first two seasons, um, he was bailing us out a lot on breakaways, and I'm not noticing those breakaways as much this year. Um, which I don't is, think it's as frequent, but w- but when they happen, he's been making some pretty big saves. I, yeah. I think in the Michigan State series, you know, there are a couple of chances where Michigan State could get back in the game if they got a goal on the rush, and he makes the big save there. Um, we've seen some of the defensemen when they're that last man back, turning the puck over, quick transition. Shearhorn's been there, so he still has that to his game. But he's just been so much more consistent on the end zone play. You know, that's I think where you'd see him. He'd get himself almost out of position and give up an easy one. And you're not really seeing that this year. He's he's playing so much sounder. Well, that's that's exactly what we need. Um, it, it'll be kind of curious to uh, what Don does. I mean, it's going to come to a point here in December where uh, Robson it will be part of the team. And, uh, you know, Shearhorn has started, it was it over 70 games in a row or something along those lines? It's it's pretty long, isn't it? Yep, he's got the streak for most consecutive starts now for the Gophers. And I don't think you can really pull him out of the net, you know, if he's playing this this consistently. I think, you know, his past suggests that every once in a while he'd have a tough Friday night and would come back and play really well on Saturday, much like last year at Yost when they gave up eight uh, Friday. <laughs> he came back the next night, and I think he only let in two. So it was a much better performance for him on Saturday, but you're just not seeing those uh, cold and hot performances out of him. No, you're not, but it does beg the question, uh, will uh, Lucia start Robson when he becomes that age? Or maybe he gives them the, the – the cl- oh, not the marriage classic, but I guess it's the, the Army series in late December. I think if there is a game to start Robson, that's probably it, just to get his feet wet, get him into a real game. You know, that's why they wanted to play him in the exhibition, was just get him used to the experience of playing at Mariucci. I think playing Army might might be the spot. You know, you'd have to break that streak. Maybe maybe they start Shearhorn and they bring in Robson for part of the game so they keep the streak. I don't know if Shearhorn or Don cares about that kind of stuff, but you might see something like that where they split a game. Um, Hammy's wondering, can we recruit Tampa State Pete for talent? Not hockey talent, but talent in the male chauvinistic kind of way. Asking for a friend. I wonder if Hammy's didn't they a... recruit somebody from Florida who didn't make it? <laughs> you know, with the with, with Don's uh, strict academic and oh, culture. Wasn't that it? Was it Gertler? Gertler isn't he? Wasn't he from Florida? I, he may have been, but Gertler was there. So, uh, I don't for, think that's. I don't think that's the kind of hockey talent we need here in the state of hockey. <laughs> I, I think Hammy, if you're doing anything down there, you should just uh, keep pushing for another Frozen Four down there because the Frozen Four in Tampa is uh, top notch. They do such a wonderful job. They, the whole town gets into it. So it, it's it's kind of wonderful. Wow, Vigo, he he thinks you sound better on Mixer than you do on Skype. So he is. That's listening. great. He, well, that's good. Hammy, good if, Hammy, if you're on Mixler, why can't you just get on Skype and we can we can add you to the to the podcast if you'd like to participate? Unless you're drinking heavily, we'll have to see. Um, we got a, a question from Mixler actually the chat there. Um, T Newell wants to know Pitlick has been outstanding this season. What do you think his NHL, NHL future will be like? Will he be well, here I think next he year? Definitely got one. Yeah. Scott, Scott Bell said he and Middlestead are probably the two uh, Gophers who have the best chance to be power play contributors in the NHL. And he's just got that first step quickness, the ability to make plays under contact. Uh, great shot. He's really good on the rush. He can change speeds. He can change, you know, his lateral uh, place on the rush. It's it's pretty impressive. I think he's definitely one guy with an NHL future. Well, I, w- I would have to agree with that. And uh, another friend in uh, in the Mixler chat, John J. Dunbar, says Flor- Gertler is a Floridian. So Gertler was from Florida. We had it right. I love how Tom just comes up with new names each week in the Mixler chat just to harass us. It's just wonderful. We'll have to see. Okay, we've got Michigan this weekend, Viggs. Out to Michigan. Out to Yoast. Uh 
Not always the greatest place for Minnesota, but they, you know, I, I don't remember the last time they were actually swept there. But they tend to get at least a split every time they go out there, at least recently. Um, what are your initial thoughts on the weekend heading to Michigan? Well, I think Michigan's a team on the rise again. I think under Red at the end, they were just a little too lax with the puck, and you're always going to get in a shootout with them. And if you tightened up defensively and managed the puck, you know, you were in a good place to get ahead and at least win one game. You know, this year I think Michigan's playing a little bit better uh, all around game. They're getting good goaltending, um, but they're they're going to be dangerous because they're young players, they're talented. They've got a lot of skill. Uh, they've got ten players from the national team development program, uh, and they're off to a pretty good start. Uh, Don Lucia said, uh, "If you don't manage the puck well against Michigan, you're going to hear hail to the victors a lot. So get used to it." <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people hate that song. I don't hate it so much because it was our song at Jefferson, but uh, not something we want to hear this weekend. Uh, you know, and you definitely don't want to hear it eight times on Friday night like you did last year. <laughs> no, we do not want to hear that. Uh, that would not be a good thing. Well, you know, we had Red Berenson finally to you know finally retire after a bajillion years. You, know, you mentioned Mel Pearson's taking over there. Um, has he really changed anything, or is it as he kind of just? Picking up the torch for for Red. I think it's a little bit of both. I think he's got their attention and playing a more consistent game. You know, they're not just so reliant on outscoring you. I think they're they're playing a little bit better overall. But also, he's walked into a situation where he's got five returning defensemen with a lot of experience, and then he's got Quinn Hughes, who's probably going to be a top ten pick in the NHL draft this summer. You know, he's a real young player, but he's definitely a talent to watch. And you know. I, for hockey fans out there, even if you're not a Gopher fan, he's going to be one to watch this weekend because of what he can do with the puck. Okay, well, we'll have to we'll definitely have to keep an eye out for that. Um, I, you mentioned earlier that the Friday game looks like it's going to be streamed on the internet. Um, did you have? Did you get any more information on that? Is it is it is it a free stream? Is it a paid stream? I I haven't had the chance to actually look myself. I'm pretty sure it's one of those uh, streams where. If you're on campus, so if you have your VPN connection through the university, you can get that stream through BTN. Or if you're one of those subscribers that BTN Plus, you know, you can get access. And it's just the in arena video, um, so it's not the highest quality, but it's something you'll be able to use to watch the game. And then uh, the Friday game initially wasn't going to be picked up at all, but uh, uh, the Big Ten Network decided to add that game. It looks like they probably don't have any. Uh, night football games that night, so they just wanted to kind of fill it. So luckily, we'll get to see Saturday night's game on on, on the Big Ten Network. But yeah, the first Big Ten Network game of the year for Minnesota. So that's nice that that happened. I, th- I think that we're just lucky that football didn't have a night game because if football would have had a night game, sorry folks, we wouldn't have had that game on TV either. So um, just just to feel good that we'll get to see that game at least. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure. You know, maybe uh, FSN didn't want to travel. I'm not. I don't even know if FSN has anything going on Friday night, so I'm not really sure what the deal was with there. Why you know FSN hasn't been doing too many road games, or at least not as many as they used to once when the Big Ten uh, league started. So I'm not really sure what happened there because I, you know, I, I believe I looked at the schedule earlier this week, and I don't think uh, I think uh, uh, FSN had some college basketball games from somewhere else in the country Friday night. So. It's not like FSN had something going on, so I'm kind of curious kind of what, what really happened there. Uh, just have to wait and well, see. Well, it's also sometimes an issue for cameras for yeah. FSN. If yep. it's just That's one true. game and it's, it's out there, it can be an issue for them. And yeah, you're right. I mean, because, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, these, these camera guys are all part of a union and, and part of a crew. And, uh, and maybe a lot of times when they were going to Michigan, they could pick up some of those uh, camera guys who would you be, usually be doing, you know, FS, FSN Detroit games. Um, you definitely don't want to pick up anybody off the street who doesn't do hockey. We've seen that in the past, and it could be some terrible camera work. That's one good thing about living here in Minnesota. We do have a lot of quality camera guys who have been doing this a long time. So whether if you're watching the wild, you know, from all kinds of sports, um, we tend to get some pretty good camera coverage here, you know, via FSN. And, you know, even when you're, when you're on the other networks, Big Ten Network or even ESPN News, it's the same crews working behind the scenes. It's just different producers. But the cameramen and all that, 
it's all the same guys. So uh, we we have it good here in Minnesota. Maybe not the case so much in other towns. At least that's what we're finding out. So, boy, I take it uh, Minnesota's practicing on Ritter Arena all this week, uh, Viggs. Uh, what did uh, what did the Don have to say about uh, practicing there and uh, other things that he may have sent up media availability today? Yep, they've been at Ritter uh, all all seasons or all week so far. They've played a couple games on NHL size sheets already this this year. So it's not one of those years where they rarely play on the smaller sheet. You know, just getting more comfortable with indirect plays, um, getting plays coming out of the corner a lot faster. You know, that's one of the things when you get in those NHL corners, that radius is tighter, and so they can get to the net a lot quicker. So everybody needs to be on their game there. And just, you know, being smart about getting pucks to the net. You know, this is a team that overpasses too much, and Lucia is really emphasizing, you know, when they're below the top of the circle, between the dots, get the puck to the net, and the other two forwards on the ice, expect the puck to go to the net. So be there for rebounds and second-chance opportunities. Hammy wants to know if Mike Legg is the best player on the Wolverines this year. <laughs> he also wants to know if uh, Petoni and McCall will get into a verbal sparring match this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hammy, are you drinking down there in uh, St. Petersburg? Could be some strong strong beverages being served down there. Because yeah, I'm sure his meetings and whatever he was doing is over since it's getting close to 11 o'clock at night there. Um, it's too bad he couldn't have You know, if he's drinking, he would have been perfect to add to the podcast tonight. We also and- hear from Tyler Sheehy uh, talking about going to Michigan, the atmosphere there. Um, and things that the forwards need to do to to up their game, especially the sustained zone pressure, you know, making smart, heavy plays, protecting the puck, uh, um, you know, not being too quick to throw the puck away. That's been one of the pet peeves for the coaches so far is the, the forwards trying to force plays when they're not there. So I think it's really important, especially going to Yost, is to have that good start with your 10-minute game, being heavy on the puck, and, and playing smart. Um, Eric Shearhorn also talked about how, you know, the Yost fans really try to get into the goalie's head, and he's expecting to hear ugly goalie every time he takes off his helmet. And uh, he loves the atmosphere. You know, these are the reasons you play college hockey, and he's looking forward to it. Well, I'm hoping the atmosphere is good because uh, what we've seen the atmosphere hasn't been that great at Mariucci yet this year. Hopefully if the team keeps swimming, the fans will keep coming back. Um, Hammy has another question, wants to know what's the over-under of a knee-on-knee hit from the Wolverines this weekend. Um we did actually see that quite a bit in the past, you know, against Michigan. Uh, I, I don't remember the player, but uh, wasn't it a qu- couple series in a row or a couple years in a row that they had a guy kicked out for a five-minute major for various yep, different he's, things? He's no longer there. I'm trying to remember the name. <laughs> I can't think of it right now. Yeah. and uh, But, yeah, I'd, he's gone, so maybe not. Maybe it's a little bit uh, cleaner team this year for for Mel. You know, I, I, you mentioned it earlier. I love it when we play Michigan. I love the style of hockey. Um, uh, hopefully it is a raucous crowd this weekend because I've always – Michigan has always been my second favorite team to play. You know, the number one team has always been North Dakota because of the rivalry, but Michigan's always been my number two team. And that's why that college hockey showcase was always a big deal for me. Um, and, and I'm hoping it keeps building here uh, in, the, in the future. Looks like Nate's already come up with it. Michael Downing. Nate is always Michael Downing. He Florida is Florida player. I always wanted to ask Kyle Rao when they got to Florida camp. He'd be like, "Hey, Downing, what's up with the cheap hits?" <laughs> I'm sure Kyle Rao would chirp him. Oh yeah, yeah. Now Rao plays for the Iowa Wild, so maybe they'll see each other in a HL game someday. <laughs> it it could be, uh, but you know, I think we need more. Um, kind of, you know, the, the Downing thing actually brought uh, the rivalry up a bit. Um, and y- we kind of need those kind of things to kind of build this rivalry and build the Big Ten. Um, because, you know, that's the biggest complaint. All these teams aren't rivalries. Well, I would disagree on Michigan and Michigan State. You know, they kind of were for all those years. But uh, um, I- I'd love to see some really good games between these two teams because um, – why well, we need Michigan to be one of these big rivals like a Wisconsin or like a North Dakota. Yeah, I think the rivalry with Michigan has always been there. I feel like there used to be more of a rivalry between Michigan hockey and Minnesota hockey when the USA hockey camps just did their teams by area. So when you went to the national camp, there would be a Minnesota team and there would be a Michigan team. I think there's always 
you know, some rivalries that started there because you'd have so many kids from Minnesota play in Minnesota and so many kids from Michigan play in Michigan. You know, now you don't have that so much because you have the Red and Aqua and Teal teams when they go to the national camp. Uh, but I, I definitely think Minnesota and Michigan players know the rivalry between the two schools. may not be as intense as North Dakota, but uh, it's up there. No, I, I agree, and I hope it just keeps building because uh... – I love the style of play, and I've always loved the games that they played against each other. Um, T. Newell from uh, the Mixler chat wants to know, we have kind of talked about this a little bit in the past, but speaking of rink size, there were rumors a few years back of converting N- uh, Mariucci to NHL size. Did that idea get swashed, or did they run out of money during the remodel? Um, uh, Viggs, you kind of mentioned this earlier, that, that it's still in the plan, but uh, it's still going to take a few years, isn't it? Yep. The, I think the initial goal was 2020 to put in the new ice plant. Uh, that's one of the things that has been legislated out there. Uh, and they want to make it 92 and a half feet. So not quite down to the NHL size, but a little bit tighter. And then the big thing is put in the NHL radius corners. So you'll see that the corners not quite be the big expanses that they are at Mary G right now. You know, I had and, heard that they were going to be in between NHL and the Olympic that it well, is. Well, that's now. the width. That's, no, no, no. I realized that, but I had in between. I, I remember Craig Floor saying that I, I believe that uh, the, the 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 radius um, for NHL is twenty four feet, and uh, Mariucci is twenty eight feet radius. I, I I can't remember the exact numbers, and I, f- I remember Craig Floor mentioning to me that they couldn't quite go to the NHL that they were going to go kind of go halfway in between on the actual radius of the corners. Um, but like you said, it's a few years away. Things can still change. I think it was mostly because of the way that the, the, the stadium is and the, the way the rows and, and all that comes together. Um, but you are right that the, the 92 and a half feet was exactly what it was going to be. They couldn't go all the way. Otherwise they had to dig a bunch more to accommodate that size. And that's just not going to happen. You know, one thing we do know that's not, no, that's not going to happen is the weight room is not going to happen over break. Like it was supposed to. Have you heard any update on that? No, no update yet. Uh, just the, the money is not going to work out for doing it over break. So it's, it's going to get pushed out. They don't have a final date yet when they're going to get working on it. But I know Cal Deeds doesn't exactly want to have, his weight room under construction during the summer. So it might be something where they're going to push it out until next year during break. Um, because, you know, Cal Dietz is a big part of this program and he does a lot of work with the players. I know they will be able to use the athletes village for some of that stuff. Um, but a lot of it's centered in Mariucci. And yeah, and actually that's what they were kind of waiting for this year. They're waiting for the athletic village to open up. So they could close down and do the reconstruction. But um, the last I heard, something about a, a donor's money kind of fell through for this year, and uh, he wasn't happy. I, I don't know the exact specifics, but uh, something weird happened with the money for the room this year, and uh, it just didn't happen. So, uh, like you said, we're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, uh, obviously, that's not good for the for the players because uh, it's an important part of the whole program. But... Uh, <sighs> And we'll just have to wait and see because I know they want to do some stuff with the club room. Um, yeah, I'll have to ask around to see if we can get any more updates on you know, what's really going to happen. But right now, it's it's going to be quieter than we thought it was going to be, unfortunately. All right, Viggs. What, what, a lot of things are on hold for the university right now. Yeah. You know, they've still got to pay off you know, $60 million for their Athletes Village. Uh, they still have to pay off their track and field complex. Um, I know the golf team is trying to raise money for their uh, practice facility. Uh, There's just a lot of hands out right now in the athletics department as they try to catch up with their uh, peers in the Big Ten and um, go for hockey for a long time has has been that, you know, second second option because they've been pretty self-sufficient for the last last 25 years. And we'll see how long that self-sufficiency keeps going. You know, obviously with the season ticket holders down and um, and uh, even total sold tickets are down. We've kept track of people actually showing up, but the total ticket sales are still declining. Um, that means less money in the coffers for the, for the U, and uh, it's something that's going to have to be looked at eventually here, Viggs. Yeah, I've, I've published the revenue stuff uh, in the past on GPL. Uh, it's 
not looking like they're going to make five million this year in revenue. So we'll we'll see what the final number looks like at the end of the year. But I bet it's going to be lower than it has been, which which means they might not be the top producer in college hockey this year. It could be, but uh, yeah, uh, there were years, even recent years. Um, I would say towards the end of the WCHA, I'm not sure the Big Ten, but they were profiting double the number two team, which was North Dakota at the time. Um, that's what also when their expenses were much less expenses have gone up dramatically because of the travel of the big 10. I mean, they, they have to fly just about everywhere now. So that expense has gone way well, up. I mean, they, it has the, the expense of it has, they haven't gone up that much because they had to travel to Denver and CC and um, Alaska before. So I don't, I don't think it's the travel so much that's restricting their, expenses yeah but you know i think it's going to see a decline in revenue yeah but now they're traveling to michigan michigan state ohio state penn state uh notre dame those that's that's five flying trips all right there um and and, and actually you know even last year they they traveled out east which is something they hadn't done much in previous years so um i think expenses are are quite an issue it's a lot different when you're doing a lot of short bus rides uh, you know, for the rest of the year, what is it? We've got a bus ride to St. Cloud and a bus ride to uh, Madison, but the rest of the road games are all flights, aren't they? That's Jube, I'll, I'll dig in for you here. I, I don't uh, think it's a huge difference to their budget. Well, you look at the expenses, though, and their expenses are a lot more than they used to be. It, some of that's, you know, funny accounting, too. Yeah, so. and that's the part I hate. You always try to figure out some of that accounting, and who knows. Anything else on this weekend? You know, we kind of already talked about the the audio you captured today, and like as usual, you always throw that on the end of the podcast. Uh, Shearhorn, Sheehy, and uh, the coach Don Lucia. Um, how do you think the team's going to do? I, I, I'm hoping a minimum a split. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely think a split is what I'm expecting coming out of the weekend. You know, with the consistent goaltending play that Shearhorn's provided, and I think the consistent puck management this team has shown, you know, they're not going to get in one of those games where they're giving up four goals plus. So I think they're, they're going to be in every every game here down this stretch, and I think going to Eos is a, is a tough proposition for any team, and I think fans should be happy if they get a split. I'm thinking a four- or five-point weekend for the Gophers. So a, a win and a tie and kind of depends on uh, the shootout. Probably more, probably more four points because I don't believe they've won a, a Big Ten shootout yet, have they? <laughs> I think their shootout list I, so far. So I, 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 yeah. I think it's just going to be three points. Yeah, we're going to see a tie. Okay, well, there you go. Um, that's all we have for this week. Remember, you can always follow Vigo on the Athletic and on his uh, Twitter account at evigo. Um, we'll be back next week to uh, recap the Michigan series. Hammy thinks it's going to be a split, we just saw. We'll have to see. And then we're going to preview a, a good team coming out from the East in Harvard. So thanks for listening. felt that way for me personally it might go back to um, my playing days I mean we had some good games with uh, against Michigan in the old WCHA days and then you know probably 1996 still sits in my craw a little bit sure <laughs> so you always see that in a, in a respectful way but you know obviously disappointing um, and then uh, as I go back to when I came in 99 I felt that if we were going to be the team we hoped to be, you got to beat Michigan. You know? I mean, they had won it in 96, 98, and then lo and behold, in two and three, we beat them in the national semifinals. And I just felt that, you know, the road goes through Ann Arbor. And uh, if you want to be an elite team, that's always a team that you have to beat. And, uh, you know, we knocked them out in, the, in uh, Joe Lewis the year before, and then they knocked us out the next year uh, from getting in the NCAA tournament. Uh, and uh, they're a much improved team, you can see it. 
Um, they're getting good goaltending. Their specialty team play is, is good. Their top couple scorers were freshmen a year ago. And they've got a couple elite incoming freshmen in Norris and uh, Hughes. And uh, now they start to resemble the, the, a deeper offensive team. And I think you look at last year's team, they just they couldn't score. They were young. And, I think their leading scorer had 20 some points. And when does that ever happen? Yeah. And uh, now they're they're uh, much deeper with three good lines and can score. And they're, they're a fourth line that's harder to play against. Five to six a year returning. And then you had a kid that's projected to be a top ten pick in the NHL draft this upcoming season. Um, and that's why you, you you see the improvement in their in their group. Knowing Mel too, I mean, it's probably not a surprise to see them bounce back as quickly as. No, I mean, you could see it coming, and and uh, you know, for Mel, it was such an easy transition for him to go back, and you know, we've we've remained pretty close over the years. And I've you know, I've always had great respect for Mel, and um, we go back to playing against Southern High School when he was at Edina, yeah. and uh, you know, he made the right move going to Michigan Tech, become a head coach, uh, did a really good job there, rebuilt their program, and um, he was the the rightful hire for, for Michigan, and uh, uh, he'll do a good job. He's done a good job, and, and, and Yost is always a difficult place to play. It's, but, I mean, hey, we're under 500, I think, since we've been in the Big Ten at Yost Arena. You've said when you play North Dakota, you don't need the video to know the kind of style you're going to play against. Is it similar with Michigan, but yeah. a different game? I mean, uh, yeah, the history says that uh, we're going to go in Friday night, and we're going to turn the puck over too much, and they're going to ram it down our throat, and then we got to... Uh, bitch at our guys for turning pucks over Saturday morning for an hour, and then we play good on Saturday and manage the puck. So uh, if you go in the history, when you go to Yost, the first 10 minutes are critical. I mean, they come out usually really strong, um, and if you mismanage the puck, they're a transition team, they're a rush team, they're a skilled team, and they make you pay. And so it really comes down to you want to shorten the rink, then you know, get used to the fight song. We are the victors because you're going to hear a lot. <laughs> Don, they've always had a big pipeline into the Ann Arbor program. They've got 10 kids on that team well, it's right now. It's a long way to recruit. It is. <laughs> but how much of an effect do you think it might have now that Danton Cole has gone to Michigan State for the, the rivalry there? I, you know, kids for the most part are still going to go where they're going to go. I mean, this day and age, my gosh, most of the kids are already committed before they even get to Ann Arbor. You know, it's not like the old days when. You know, you weren't recruiting. You were recruiting those kids at the end of that first year, that spring. So they're all available, but that's not the case anymore. Um, is it an advantage? Sure, it is. I mean, the tryouts are there. And, you know, they, they can come over to your games, and um, they get used to living there. They have billet families that the, you know they can probably go back to when they're at Michigan. But um, so they've been able to get some some good players there. You know, I think what's hurt Michigan is last number of years is all the defections to the pros and the CHL. And they've lost a lot of guys that never got there, including some good goaltenders and the one and done the last few years. So, you know, they paid the price for that, like you know a lot of us have. When you think of the names like Stauber and Shellstead and you know some of the legendary goalies that have come through this program, is Eric there? I mean, we, you know the records well, say he is, but yeah, I mean he's uh, this year he's playing well. You know we're ten games in. I think he is safe to say that he's played his best hockey as a as a golfer. Um, and I think that you know we're seven and three. There's obviously some areas of our game that we still have to improve upon. That we're we're certainly not a finished product. But Eric's been there to bail us out so far. Uh, and. You look back to a year ago where he, the first half of the year, he was hot and cold. And uh, then the second half, he evened out his play, and our team made a step. And this year, he's been, you know, pretty much, uh, he is not, he's yet to have a bad game, you know. And, and uh, I think that's the big reason why we're 7 and 3 so far. And obviously, we're going to need him this weekend. And we went in there last year, and he played really well in game two. We won 3 to 2, and, um, or 4 2, whatever it was. And, uh, that's what you have to have. I mean, we're, we're going to Ann Arbor and we're going to play in Yost. It'll be a good, a good atmosphere, uh, tight corners. The play's going to come at your net quickly, and he's going to have to make some saves. And uh, so far, he's been able to do that. And then if he can continue to give up a couple goals a night, it puts us in a great position to try to win games. It's going to be a little weird to uh, look across the, uh, the bench and not see Ray Barron's in there? No, I, I think for me, not so much that, uh, I mean, Mel's been such a big part of their program for so many years. It's kind of like for him, it's like an old shoe going back there. And, uh, you know, the, the style that they're going to play has not changed. It's not like uh, when you think of Michigan or you think of Minnesota, you think of teams who want to get up in the playoff. And 
and uh, that's certainly the case uh, for Michigan this year. You know, we've been more defensive this year, and that's been a key to our success than what we've done offensively because we've got a long way to go offensively. We just we haven't generated enough shots. We haven't generated enough uh, goals on a consistent basis. I think our defensemen are doing a better job uh, of creating some offense, uh, getting more shots on goal, but uh, the onus is on our forwards to you know, play a heavier game, to play a faster game, and, and to generate more shots because I think we overpass at times right now. You said you're looking for more sustained zone pressure. Mm-hmm. What are the keys to that? Uh, uh, you got to move your feet to get to the next spot in the ice. That's number one. Uh, number two, you have to, you know, puck protect and win some of those confrontational battles. And then uh, you have to make a, a, a skill play under contact. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, there's you can try, but you have to be effective too. I mean, at some point, you have to make an offensive play. And to go along with that is, I think, when we do have chances, sometimes we overpass and be at nothing. And it's still a good play to get a puck on the net and be around the net for rebounds. And our guys still at times, I think, too often want to make two or three tic-tac-toe tap-in goals rather than, you know, you have the puck inside the top of the circles, you have the puck inside the dots. The mindset has to be deliver the puck to the net. And the other two guys should understand that, no, that's where it's going to be delivered, and now you're in a position to get rebound goals. The polls in, in November don't mean a lot, or maybe don't mean a lot at any time of year, but you knowing Bob Monsko as well as you do with all the returning scoring, yeah. they had coming back. You can't be too surprised to see No, I mean, they, you know, talking to Bob, they knew they were going to have a really good team this year. And, um, you know, the, I think what hurt them last year was goaltending. And uh, they're getting really good goaltending so far this year. they got a deep and uh, a defensive crew, and uh, they can score. When you can score, you get to four on a regular basis, you're going to win a lot of games because that's the difference for the most part between, you know, good teams and elite teams is, you know, how good offensively are they and how deep offensively are you. Um, and uh, when you've got that uh, offensive firepower, you can, even if your goalie has a bad game, you can overcome it. A lot of teams, if your goalie doesn't have to play well, you don't have enough offense to overcome it. Is he going to be here for that series in January? Will he still be at World Juniors? Uh, no, he, actually they get back. Cause we, we, that's why it's a Saturday-Sunday. Oh. Because I, I knew we'd be missing a couple guys, and they would too. So we just said, let's play it Saturday-Sunday so everybody can get back for that, that weekend. Makes sense. Eric, I guess uh, you four straight wins. Uh, what's what's the feeling? Uh, what, how'd, you, how'd your game right now? Uh, I mean, it's good. Uh, no complaints on my end. Uh, Deer doing their job. Fords are doing their job as far as... Uh, defensive responsibilities so uh, it's nice to get on a four game roll here um, going into Yost haven't had the best of luck on Fridays the last couple of years so we're looking to turn that around. Yeah, you mentioned earlier in the season that you've sort of uh, I guess calmed down your game a little bit can you talk a little bit about that and how that's really attributed to your success? Yeah I mean it's just um, it's just a sense of calmness in my game that, that I think you can see whether it's um, second saves, body positioning, rebounds um, I'm just I'm making things a lot easier on myself as far as you know not not getting out of the crease too much and and that positionality and that calmness again helps me make those second saves and uh, just you know helps me eat up first shots too. You mentioned the defense uh, really stepping up a lot. They went through a lot of changes coming into this season. What what have they done to really really to help you out? Well, I, I think the biggest thing, and I've said it before, is you look at shots on goal, right? You, you go. In, you know, 19 shots on goal, 27 shots on goal, 26 shots on goal, and I think 19 again in the last four games. I mean, if you know, averaging out in the lower to mid 20s, that's that's good for me. It's good for the team, and uh, it's going to equal success. Penalty kills had a streak of success lately. What are you seeing different as a goalie on the penalty kill unit? Uh, I mean, clears. Uh, I mean, I think if you look at the the video of the penalty kill, we're, we're winning draws. And, and we're clearing it right away, and from there we're not letting them set up. So I think the biggest thing is that first draw. When we get that first draw and we kill it and we clear it right away, we, we never allow them to get momentum or zone time. You mentioned yeah. Friday night not having as much success in Michigan. What are you guys trying to do to yeah. change that? I mean, we're just coming in extra focused. I mean, I, I guess you can't really think about past Friday nights, right? But, um, you know, there's definitely extra emphasis. We know that we haven't been great on Friday, but we've came back Saturday, so... Uh, instead of doing that this time, we want to go Friday and Saturday. 
the Yoast crowd is pretty legendary. Do you, yeah. you like those atmospheres? I, you love it. You know, as a, as a goalie, you, um, at least I take pride in you know wanting to shut those guys up, right? Um, but yeah, it's awesome. You you want to play in those environments. Um, you know, you take an environment like that ten times out of ten over a dead crowd. Do you hear it, or do you, are you able to block it out? Uh, you, you hear some of it. You mostly hear it um, between whistles. Um, or TV timeouts, you know, they give you the ugly goalie chant when you take off the mask. Um, but during the game, you don't really hear much. You're piling up uh, goalie of the week honors uh, pretty good here. What, what thoughts are going through your mind as, as you collect these? Uh, you know, not much. I, I don't read too much into it. Um, I like to say they're team awards, obviously, because, you know, going back to talking about shots on goal and how well our defense is doing. I'm not getting these awards if they're not doing that. So, um, you know, wins are the awards you want. What type of things are you expecting from Michigan, and how are you going to battle? Uh, I mean, they're always a fast-paced team, and they're a highly skilled team. Um, so I think as much as our team can, you know, make smart plays and, and limit our turnovers, I, I think that'll, um, you know, be able to slow down their offense uh, a lot. John has talked about physically keeping you in shape and if you need a day off here and there you know he's willing to give it to you how much of that do you do you factor in or is it just only two games a week uh, I mean I don't think I don't think I really need days off you know I played two seasons in juniors where I played you know in the mid 40s of games and that's a 60 game schedule spanning you know more time so and you know the forwards don't get days off I don't I don't need days off do you track how many uh, Consecutive saves you make, you know, where you have to make back-to-back -back saves, and, and are there very few this year? You're so, facing very few second yeah, shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't keep track of that, um, but I have noticed it. You know, um, whether it's one shot and I'm holding it on, so there's no rebound, or one shot and the defense is clearing them right out. Um, I mean, that's a big contributor to why you know our goals against is below two right now. Um, and yeah, and and why the shots are so low. So yeah, I have noticed it. Is there anything you do track besides goals against and save percentage? <sighs> no, honestly, I I try not to look at those too much either because I I just feel like if I stick to my process of being square, being aggressive, and tracking the puck, um, those numbers will come and the wins will come along with it. So I try not to get caught up in that because you can get distracted by it. Proverbial monkey off the back with that goal, eh? That yeah. had to be feeling good. Yeah, it was getting a little bit frustrating. I uh, hit a few posts um, early on and um, just couldn't find the back of the net there. So it was good to get a nice pass from Tom and then see it finally go in. What kind of things are you looking to do defensively to shut down Michigan offense? Um, just kind of stick to what we've been doing. We, I think our defensive play has been pretty good uh, these last few weekends and um, kind of talked about the little details and getting pucks out and um, – you know, for the most part, our offensive game playing down low is going to, you know, prevent their offense. So um, as long as we're on them, playing hard, um, hopefully we can shut down their offense. Anything special playing Michigan? You know, they were the team that kept you out of the NCAAs two years ago. It's about the only blemish on this run. The Gophers have the Big Ten. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever you're going to Michigan, it's, uh, you know, Minnesota, Michigan's awesome. Um, you know, playing at Yost and their fans is, is, uh, is great. And like you mentioned, uh, a couple years ago they kept us out of the tournament. They had a great team and um, unfortunately beat us in that last game in uh, the Big Ten tournament. So uh, there's always going to be something going into the game, and um, hopefully we can carry out a good battle this weekend. Nice skating with Tommy Novak, isn't it? What's that, the play like between the two of you? Yeah, we've played, we played quite a bit together these last few years, and um, he's just a guy who can, who can put the puck on your stick, make a ton of plays, and um, sometimes you just got to sit back and watch him and just kind of, you know, drop your jaw a little bit. He's a, he's a really good player, and it's always great when you get to play with a guy like that. Eric's finding his consistency a little bit earlier in the season this, uh, this year in the first half. Uh, is there anything different about him? I know he being roommates in L. Anything different off the ice? Um, well, I just know he put in a lot of work this off season. Um, did a great job of uh, getting in the weight room and then working with his goalie coaches. Uh, he's been phenomenal so far this year, and um, you know, like you said, consistent, which is most important. Um, and you know, he's always going to have uh, you know a solid effort with us, and um, we can definitely rely on him in the back end there. Coaches always say when a goalie's on his game, guys can take more risks or play more relaxed. I mean, is that for real? Do you do you feel that? Do you think, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't make this pass, but Eric's back there, we're fine. Uh, you know what? I think there's going to be times where where you do make that play. Obviously, you're not trying to, you know, you're not trying to say, oh, you know, Eric's back there, we're okay. But 
when you when you do make that play, it's going to happen throughout throughout the season, throughout a game. Um, and you kind of know Eric's got your back. He's going to make a great save. Um, you know, I've seen him these past few years make unbelievable saves, and he's he's been the backbone um, these past couple of years, and um, he's deserved the goal goal of the year award a couple times. So, uh, yeah, when you make a mistake, you definitely know he's back there to save you. You know, power play started off a little bit slow this year, but what type of adjustments have been made where it's beginning to click a lot better? Yeah, there was a few uh, personnel adjustments, um, and we've just been working on it quite a bit in practice. We've been trying to uh, trying to incorporate it a couple times uh, throughout the practice, you know, split between drills, um, and just kind of moving the puck and getting shots in that. We really talked about um, teams in the NHL who have the best power plays are the ones who shoot the most, so we kind of try to incorporate that into our own power play. And, uh, these past couple weekends, it's been um, it's been good. Not only scoring a couple goals, but getting momentum as well. Yeah, because earlier it seemed like you're working the perimeter a lot, but not getting a whole lot of action towards the net. Yeah, it was kind of one of those things we couldn't, uh, you know, we weren't shooting off the pass, and, and we just, you know, frankly, we're not shooting a lot. So um, we focused on that. We try to get as many pucks to the net as we can and get guys there. So um, we've had a we've had a good, or a few a few goals here in the power play. John said he's looking for more sustained pressure in the offensive zone. Have you noticed that in film sessions, and, and what's missing for your game to get that? Yeah, we uh, we had a film session just with the forward group about playing heavy, um, and we kind of went over plays that we weren't heavy, and then plays where we were, we were playing uh, you know strong on the puck and, and making uh, heavy rel- relentless plays. Um, but yeah, you can notice it in video um, when we're not we're not playing relentless and, and playing heavy, but. Uh, you know, overall, these pa- these past couple weekends, we've, I think we've improved on that a little bit. So um, it's a good step for us. Is that key for playing a team like Michigan on the road is to play heavier? Yeah, absolutely, especially right off, you know, on a Friday night right away. You want to have that good 10-minute game and get right on them. Um, so, yeah, you know, when you're playing Michigan, they're going to be skilled and fast. Um, and you want to, you know, you want to be able to, to, you know, give it to them a little bit. So um, it's definitely going to be important this, this weekend. What's the biggest challenge those Michigan players give you guys? Um, well, you know, I don't know a lot about them just because they're they're so young, but they're they're so skilled. That's the thing. Um, you know, last year I think they had a little bit of a down year, but um, like I said, they're young. Um, but those guys are their best players are the young guys. So um, yeah, they're they're going to be really fast, really skilled. Um, you know, they get all those guys from Ann Arbor, and usually those are the guys that are fast and you know can make a ton of plays. So we just got to make sure we're we're playing well defensively. Great, thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks.